Hello new and soon to be fear and hunger Termina players. Are you someone interested in the game but unsure whether or not you'll enjoy it? Have you recently purchased this game and are struggling a lot? Or are you a long term fan of the series who needs something to send their friends who are either of the first two categories? Well, this video is for you. This video is a spoiler free introduction to the mechanics and mindset of Termina. A lot of players are turned off by how dark and unforgiving the Fear and Hunger series can be. But if you can get into the right mindset, then these games offer a truly unique and enjoyable experience that you'll remember for years. And soon, you'll understand why it has such a passionate and devoted fan base. And maybe you'll become a true fan as well. Without further ado, let's get into it. This game is unforgiving. Small mistakes can shape the remainder of your playthrough, or even cut it short. The fact is, you're going to die. You're going to die quite a lot. Sometimes you'll even lose hours of progress. And that's okay. It'll take a while for you to understand the mechanics. And even simple enemies will kill you regularly when you start playing. This game rewards learning from your past mistakes. There's going to be times where you can't progress. You'll make too many bad choices, or take too much damage in fights, or get a status effect that makes playing basically impossible, and you can't go forward anymore. At times like this, it's okay to reload an old save, or even abandon a playthrough. Losing this hard is an opportunity to start fresh and put the lessons you've learned into action. Next time, you'll see just how much you've grown. How difficult the game is even comes across in its difficulty settings. There isn't even an easy mode, just easier than normal. For most players, it's still pretty hard, so don't be ashamed on playing at this level when you start out. The hardest difficulty is called masochism mode, and <laughs> let me tell you, it lives up to its name. Termina, like its predecessor, has remarkably good built-in and subtle tutorials for the player. Part of the tutorials is scaring away all the built-up rules from other video games. It's important to note that this game, despite looking similar to a regular JRPG, is not one. You likely haven't played anything quite like these games before. The consequences for bad choices range from merely painful to game ending. And to be perfectly clear, a lot of choices seem unfair if you don't know about them beforehand and you can't always predict the results. There's a lot of hidden triggers throughout the game, and other contestants will move around the map as the days progress. You may find that a character you wanted to recruit or an enemy you wanted to fight is unavailable in a playthrough because of something minor you did hours earlier. This isn't a game where you're expected to do all the content in a single playthrough. There's even three different endings, two of which you can be locked out of while playing if you're not sure how to reach them. While there are invisible choices, there's still plenty you can see coming. Do you fight an enemy that's hunting you down now? Or try to keep running from him and I hope he doesn't trap you somewhere? Do you eat your last scrap of food to get rid of the hunger debuff? Or save it in case you can't find any later? Even saving the game is a serious choice. The main way is sleeping in a bed, where you can save and upgrade your skills. We'll talk a little more about skills later. Every time you sleep, time advances one state. There's three days, each divided into morning, noon, and night. Sleeping is the only way to progress time. It doesn't tick while you're playing. But as you can only save eight times using this method, you have to be careful. The second way is by using a sigil of the God of Fear and Hunger on an Ascended God Circle. I'll explain sigils and circles a bit more later, but for now just know that this is limited too. On normal and masochism difficulty, you can only save once per circle, although this is increased to three times in easier mode. Making choices like this, progressing time or killing certain people, it can be hard to see the consequences of your actions until you've made that choice a few times over multiple playthroughs. And even then, you're probably going to make a few bad choices. Well, the good news is, Every bad choice is a chance to learn. Sometimes, you'll realise you've really screwed your playthrough. Maybe you're completely out of healing items or food. Maybe your character is missing three limbs and is bleeding to death. You can just quit here and start again. Or, you can take the opportunity to experiment. This is a doomed timeline after all. You might as well learn as much as you can. See what happens if you let an enemy keep attacking you. Maybe you'll see an ability you hadn't before. Maybe you can try a completely new method of fighting someone. Who knows, it could end up being better. But not every mistake automatically leads to a doomed playthrough. Most of the time, you'll just lose a limb or get some negative status effects for your troubles. Everything that happens to you in combat will have long-term effects. Healing is limited, 
Status effects require specific items to remove, and some enemies can very easily remove your limbs, which are difficult to reattach. Party members dying is very permanent. Once they're gone, they're gone. Despite this, there are ways to tackle every fight in the game that minimize or even completely remove the worst effects. The aim of each fight is to lower the enemy's HP to zero while keeping your HP above zero, while also keeping your mind, ammo, limbs, and consumable items as high as possible. Everything is a resource for you to expend to reach your goals. If you're the sort of person who hoards powerful items waiting for when you'll need them most, well, it's best to get over that really quickly. When you're a new player, you're going to be pushed to your limits and will need every edge you can get. Items also function in pretty interesting ways sometimes, so it's useful to try them out early to understand them better. Your companion's lives are also a resource for you to play with. Do you keep them alive to have extra attacks in a turn and extra meat shields? Or do you kill them now to get access to their unique abilities from their souls? Despite the game rewarding knowledge, there's still a level of RNG throughout the experience to keep you on your toes. Small choices like using specific items or keeping an extra companion can help buffer you against RNG, but how important is it really? RNG matters a lot in Termina, but maybe not as much as you'd think. If anything, the randomness in the game is mostly there to help newer players who have gaps in their knowledge. You can easily beat every enemy in the game with basic items and spells that are easy to obtain in guaranteed locations. The bulk of RNG is in the form of items discovered while searching. Finding a great piece of armor or extra healing items can be a great boost, but ultimately, you can finish the game while scavenging very little. You can harvest or buy enough items to manage your healing. And the very best weapons and armor can be found in guaranteed locations, although you do have to work for it. There are some very good items that are RNG only from chests or crates, but these aren't necessary. We'll discuss items in depth a little later. In combat, there is a small variation in the amount of damage you deal, the player can occasionally deal critical hits, and attacks can miss. All very standard stuff in JRPGs. Enemies usually have multiple attacks they can choose from in a turn, and some enemies can even do nothing at all. This is where the real RNG comes in. You can get easy turns for long enough to finish a fight, or get smacked by tougher attacks in quick succession. Some enemies will also have what's called a devastating attack, or a coin flip attack. Like the name suggests, these deal quite a lot of damage or have other harsh effects. But you have 50% chance of avoiding them completely by flipping a coin. You can even add spare lucky coins to increase your chances. But if you guard in the turn it's used, you can avoid it entirely. It's automatically counted as a successful coin flip. For astute players, you'll notice that enemies usually have a special message on the turn before they use these attacks. Combat in Fear and Hunger is very different from other games. In fact, it's probably better to think of each encounter as a puzzle. Instead of having multiple enemies in each fight, you usually target the enemy's limbs instead. Removing limbs in the correct order is key to beating enemies while taking minimal or even no damage. Usually, enemy arms will be the main attacking force, and each arm will perform an action once per turn. Sometimes it's completely random from their pools of attacks, but some enemies have patterns they follow. An enemy limb may have a unique attack they always perform on a specific turn, whereas another limb on the same enemy may choose randomly between attacking and doing nothing. If you suspect there's a strong attack coming next turn, don't be afraid to guard. Saving a little more HP against an attack can really help. In many games, status effects like poison, burn, or bleeding aren't particularly useful. In Termina, they definitely can be. Regular enemies usually don't have enough HP to need damage over time effects, but they can be incredibly good on bosses. Although some bosses are immune to certain types. There's some interesting status effects you can use, and I encourage experimenting with these. You'll never know when you can use one in a tough fight. Each weapon and spell deals a specific type of damage. Enemies have different weaknesses to the various damage types, but honestly, outside of rare circumstances, you won't notice much of a difference. If you do need a slight edge, you can see what an enemy's weakness is if you examine their body using Dan's ability, Diagnosis, to make the fight easier next time. In combat, you might notice the little triangles next to your character's names. These are rev points, and if you rev up before attacking, you'll deal more damage. Importantly though, if you use three rev points, you'll attack twice in the same turn. It's very strong, and adds an interesting layer of strategy to fights. 
do you use Rev now and try to finish a fight early, or save up to deliver a massive blow later? Termina expanded on the bow and arrow system of the first game to add three kinds of guns. In combat, they act like a regular attack, albeit a pretty strong attack that consumes ammo, but guns really shine outside of combat. If you have one equipped and push shift, you can shoot enemies on the overworld and kill them without even entering combat. Although it is important to note that if you do enter combat before killing them, all damage is lost and you'll have wasted your ammo. Pistols just deal damage, shotguns deal a lot more damage and also stun the enemy for a short time. But the real standout weapon here is the rifle. You can remove most enemies arms with this gun, which does carry over if you enter combat, making fights much easier. Not every enemy can be shot before fighting them, and some that can be shot still can't have their limbs removed. When you're new, you'll probably die a lot while you study these mechanics. But once they become ingrained, you'll know exactly how to combat each enemy. Sometimes the best strategy is to run away from combat or not engage at all. There's going to be times where you have no idea how to fight an enemy. That's okay. Most of the time you can just run away. Discretion is the better part of Valor, after all. But even if you know how to fight every enemy in the game, sometimes, enemies need certain resources to combat them properly, such as good enough weapons or specific buff items or spells, and you can encounter that enemy before you get those things. Fear and Hunger shares this with the Dark Souls series. Knowing which enemies you need to fight and when to fight them is as important as knowing how to fight them. As you play, you'll learn what rewards you get from each enemy and how much it'll cost you to fight them. Some enemies have very good rewards and are worth fighting as soon as possible. And others, you simply never have to fight at all. It can even be worth fighting an enemy just so they won't be there to annoy you later. Keeping in line with the themes of the game, dead enemies are their own resource to manage. You don't level up in the traditional way in Termina. There's no experience points for killing enemies, but you do need to kill them to gain new abilities. Improving your character is done through two ways, gaining skills and gaining items. We'll discuss items later, but as for skills, whenever you sleep, you'll see the option to visit the Hexen. It's an almost overwhelming array of skills here, but at the beginning, you can only unlock a very limited amount if you even have the currency for it. To get the currency, you need heads, you need to kill enemies and cut their heads off using a bone saw. If you offer these heads on a new god circle, you can trade them for soulstone shards. With three shards, you can make a soulstone and use that to unlock a new ability on the Hexen. Even death is a resource in Termina. But how do you make more abilities available to unlock? Well, there's two kinds of abilities here. One's from the gods and one's from human souls. Human soul abilities you can unlock by, you guessed it, killing whoever owns that soul. Keep in mind that you or your party members have to kill them in combat to use their soul. If they die from other means, then you can't. Each character starts with their own soul, of course, so you'll usually have one or two abilities available for purchase when you start. As for god abilities, they're a little more complex. They're broken into two categories, old god and ascended god. If you have the skin bible of a god, some chalk, and the appropriate ritual circle, if you draw their sigil onto it, then you gain one affinity point with that god. You can see on the Hexen how much affinity with a specific god is needed to unlock a skill. The sigils of Ormir and the god of fear and hunger can be drawn on the ascended circles, which is a cross and spiral shape. And the sigils of Rare, Sylvian, Vanushka, and Grogoroth are drawn on an old god circle, which is shaped like a star. If you draw them on the wrong one, then, well, you just wasted it. No takesies backsies here, guys. Some of the sigils do something very unique when used. For example, when you draw the sigil of the god in fear and hunger, not only do you get affinity with that god, it lets you save without advancing time. Each god's sigil has a unique interaction, and there are also some ways to gain affinity outside of drawing sigils, but I'll leave that for you to discover. Once you have enough affinity for a god, or you have another character's soul, and you have enough soul stones to buy what you want, simply visit the Hexen again and select the ability you want and who you want to give it to. Like other RPGs, there's a mix of active and passive skills. Some skills are combat only, and some can only be used outside of combat. And look, there's no two ways about it. It'll take you a while to understand all the skills and how they work, and you'll waste a lot of resources buying more than a few skills you don't like. I recommend buying the skills for the character you're playing as first, and trying them as much as possible, so you can really get to understand them. 
And then eventually when you play other characters, you'll figure out how to combo them together. There's some really powerful combinations available. Each character starts with some of their own abilities unlocked and sometimes abilities from other souls or even the gods. But on top of that, some characters have unique mechanics entirely. Despite the ability to gain every skill from every other character, some of the characters are still unique. The most obvious example of this is Olivia. She's wheelchair bound with all the negatives that entails and no other character can gain this condition no matter what. Marco, the trained boxer, has a unique punching attack when he doesn't have any weapons equipped that no other character can gain. Osar the Yellow Mage is the only member of the cast who can't use guns at all. Three of the cast cannot use two-handed weapons at all. Karen, Marina, and Olivia aren't strong enough to wield them. These unique traits carry over when you recruit them as party members too. And unfortunately, you can't use soul stones to unlock more of their abilities if they're in your party. That's another hard choice you're forced to make. If they have an ability you really want that isn't unlocked by default, then sorry, they've got to die. Something important to note is that not every contestant is playable right now, both as a main character or recruitable NPC. The only recruitable contestants right now are the ones you can select on the title screen. There are other characters you can recruit, but I'll let you find out who they are yourself. When you do have party members, you can let them rest in one of the safe locations you can find around the city, like the train. Be aware that they keep any items they have equipped when they leave, so if they've got something valuable, make sure to unequip it. When you're ready to go again, just talk to them and ask them to rejoin you. Speaking of valuable equipment, it's time to discuss items. Fear and Hunger is a survival game series. You need to be searching every container, every fridge, every bookshelf, and every chest for items. The items you'll find are broken into the following categories. The items category holds any item that doesn't fit in the other categories. It's quest items, ammo, money, and miscellaneous crafting items. There's also some consumables in here with unique effects that can be very useful in battle, including some that can apply status effects to enemies. So make sure to check out what's in your items every once in a while, and keep an eye on the stat and buff icon boxes. Any item in the healing category either refills mind or HP, or removes negative status effects. There's many crafting recipes for healing items if you get the right books. You'll probably spend a lot of time in this menu. There's multiple tiers of food items you can find, and if you have some recipe books, you can combine many of them for better food. You'll usually find books in bookshelves scattered around the world. Whenever you pick up a book, you will not get doubles of most of them, with a couple of exceptions. There's multiple kinds of books. Some give you recipes, some are just lore, and then there's the skin bibles which gives you access to the sigils of the god contained within. You can't draw a god's sigil without the corresponding skin bible. You'll mostly find weapons on bodies of defeated enemies, but you can also rarely find them in containers or other key locations. Attack strength is the main stat that affects how much damage you do, and even a little more can have major effect in battle. Armor includes head and chest armor as well as any accessories you find. Accessories in particular have a major impact on how you build your character. And like weapons, you can sometimes find very good armor or accessories in random containers. The body bag stores all the limbs you find, any heads you cut off, and any organs you harvest. You usually won't need to look in here, but it is a good place to look for emergency food. In a pinch, of course. I mentioned crafting before, and in Termina, it's pretty simple. There are a couple of recipes unlocked by default, but you can't see them unless you have some of the ingredients, and they're usually not very useful anyway. The most important recipes come from finding recipe books, the Alchemilia books, and the recipes of the 16th century books. These allow you to craft all kinds of very useful items, so make sure you search bookshelves for them. You can also get more recipes from certain skills. Items are half the equation when it comes to character building, with skills being the other half. If you combine them together, well, you can get pretty dang strong. So, when you first play Termina, it'll feel like every enemy is absolutely broken and unbeatable and hits like a truck. The good news is, you can become broken and unbeatable and hit like a truck too. Fear and Hunger is primarily a series that rewards knowledge. Almost every top tier item is found in guaranteed location, and the items that aren't have alternatives that are almost as good. A knowledgeable player can do any fight in the game and come out with all their limbs still attached and at full HP and full mind. You can even become literally unkillable with specific setups. Fights in Termina may be a puzzle, but they're puzzles with multiple solutions. 
There's many ways to become incredibly strong. There's many weapons, spells, and accessories that are excellent, and despite that, many fights can be won with pretty weak equipment if you tackle them correctly. It's a fantastic feeling to be destroyed by basic enemies at the start of the game, only to turn around and become a monster yourself. There's nothing quite like beating a powerful boss in a single turn who you used to really struggle against, or coming up with unexpected tactics against enemies and completely turning the tide of what was once a tough fight. Once you learn how the game works, and where all the goodies are, you become a real force to be reckoned with. If you come into the game with the mindset to learn how it functions, and understanding that you're going to die a lot, then there's a good chance you'll find a very rewarding experience behind the piles of bloody bodies and dismembered limbs. The Fear and Hunger series is truly amazing, and the difficulty is part of the charm. If you go in with the right mindset, and even then don't enjoy the experience, that's okay. A series as unforgiving and dark as Fear and Hunger is simply not going to be for everyone, but sometimes all you need is a little perspective shift to enjoy it, and I hope this video could help. And because I know there's going to be a lot of people asking, how about I recommend a starter build for you guys? This will mention specifics, so if you want to be as spoiler free as possible, then just go on to the next video now. For everyone else, all the characters have their strengths and weaknesses, so you can be fine as a new player with anybody except maybe Osar, who is probably a bit tougher for newer players. I suggest starting with Abella and choosing Mechanics in her intro to gain Wrench Toss. It's a very strong ability by itself, but importantly, because you can use it to stun limbs, it helps you get into the mindset of shutting down limbs one at a time. However, if you're really struggling, then consider starting with Marco instead. If you choose the following options in his intro, Burglar, Stamina, Defense, Escape, and Medical Goods. You have arguably one of the best starts for any character in the game. Even just his bare fists deal more damage than most weapons you'll get for a long time. And since you're not playing as her, you can recruit Abella pretty quickly if you do need the extra help. But like I said before, all the characters really shine in their own ways, so I do recommend trying them all out and getting to know their abilities. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope it helped. If it did, please let me know down in the comments. Also stream Fear and Hunger right here on this channel, so come say hi sometime. My name's Morde Duke, and I'll see you next time.